started. Bay Area 2. Great, got some more people joining. Hi, Emil. Awesome, we've got some more folks. Hey everyone, thanks so much for joining. We're just waiting another minute or two before we get started here so everyone can join. If you wanna go ahead and drop your location in the chat, the chat feature is at the bottom. You can click chat and then it will load on the right side of your screen. Awesome, cool. So we'll give it one more minute. We're excited for a really awesome conversation today. I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy. I hope everyone's loved ones are healthy and safe. I hope everyone's Netflix accounts are just bursting with <laughs> new opportunities for them. <laughs> or whatever your, you know, viewing thing is. Maybe it's not Netflix, maybe you're a Hulu person. Okay, we'll give it just one more minute here. We can see there's more people joining. Awesome. Got some friends here. Thanks everyone for joining us. We're excited. Oh, we've got somebody from San Jose. Awesome. Hello. Where else is everyone from? Seems like it's all Bay Area folks right now. I know Dr. Koloje is from New York, so he's representing the East Coast. Okay. Bay Area, Palo Alto, nice, nice, okay, okay, great. So I'm gonna get started here. Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining. My name is Maddie Watt and I am the Senior Manager of People and Programs at The Hive. I'm gonna just really quickly go over the ground rules for this webinar's interaction before I explain what The Hive Think Tank does and then I'm gonna pass our virtual microphone over to Kamesh Radhavandra, The Hive's Chief Product Officer. So real quick, chat rules. Please be respectful in the chat. Please drop your location. We're excited to hear where you're from and we wanna see if we have any friends from around the world. Um, and also please don't use this time to promote or plug your product. This is just not the place for that. And I appreciate you respecting our ground rules. Uh, also, you can ask questions to our presenters. We love questions. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you're gonna see a Q&A function and you're gonna wanna use that to ask your questions to the presenters. And this is just so it gets captured all in one place. So instead of putting your question in the chat, if you could put it in the Q&A, section that would be really helpful and you can also upvote different questions that you want to see answered so if there's something on there that you really want to see go ahead and upvote it so it goes to the top of the list and that's going to be more likely to get answered by our panelists uh, let's see what else also this session is being recorded and will be available later for viewing on the hives youtube channel usually takes about a day to get it uploaded so I will go ahead and put the link for this, um, our YouTube channel, into the chat. And then you can also send that to any friends or colleagues that weren't able to join this so they can view it later. And lastly, if you are going to be following along on social media, we love that, use the hashtag HiveData. So real quickly, I'm going to just share my screen and we are going to talk about what the Hive Think Tank does and our upcoming events. Just give me one minute here, folks. Ooh, why is it not? Hmm. I think because I'm recording, I cannot share it. That's all right. You know what? We're going to do this. I'm gonna talk about the events that we have going and then we will take it from there. So the Hive Think Tank, what we do is we are an ecosystem of entrepreneurs, corporations, and thought leaders. We have a content and event platform and we're bringing you events every week right now. So if you join us next week, you're going to find that we have a webinar on Thursday at 11 a.m., the Remote Design Innovation. And this is gonna be with our friends from Conrad and King. They are gonna talk all about how design is driving innovation right now and give you helpful tips and tools that are uh, you can use right now from home during this time where we all have to be remote. 
And that's gonna be again next Thursday, 11 a.m. Pacific. And then the following week on Wednesday, the 27th at 11 a.m., we have, again, Pacific, Transportation Transformation. And this is gonna be an in-depth conversation between two thought leaders in the transformation space, Evangelos and Steven. They're our friends here at The Hive, and they are talking about uh, Evangelos's latest book, Transfer Transportation Transformation. Ah, perfect. Thank you, Ravi or Kamesh, whoever. Yes, Ravi, thank you very much for doing Hi. this for me. <laughs> um, perfect. Okay. So this is going to be on Wednesday, the 27th, 11 a.m. Pacific. And we hope you can join us. I'm going to drop the link for these events in the chat functionality. Uh, so that way you can join along. And we also just want to thank our sponsors before we go ahead and pass it off to Kamesh. So we have sponsors like Avanta, Tibco, SAP, IBM, Verizon, Intuit. If you want to find out more about how to work with us on these events, either sponsoring or doing a webinar with us, we would love to get to know you. And I would appreciate if you just email me. I will, again, drop my email in the chat function so you can go ahead and email me and we can talk more about this offline. So without further ado, Kamesh, our Chief Product Officer, is going to explain a little bit more about what the Hive does generally, and then it will be up to our great speakers to lead you through how payers and providers are helping and assisting during this pandemic. Thanks. Thank you, Matty. Thanks for uh, organizing this event for all of us. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're dialing into the world. I hope all of you are staying well. Um, and Ravi, if I could... Uh, use the screen share that you've uh, gotten working with Zoom and, and use those slides, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, it looks like Zoom has had some trouble today because they're pushing a massive app upgrade. Uh, so let's, let's hope this continues to work uh, through this whole event. Um, so, so as uh, uh, Matty mentioned earlier, the Hive is an early stage venture capital fund and a venture co-creation studio. Um, we, we work very closely with uh, both entrepreneurs and uh, companies, large corporates, um, to fund, build, and launch companies. Um, we are very thematically focused uh, on applications of artificial intelligence and data in very specific uh, kind of enterprise business domains. Um, we obviously have a, a deep interest in digital health, uh, and, and you know, that, that goes without saying, given, given the nature of this event that we've organized together with, with all of you. Um, but apart from digital health, we are also interested in, in technology, data-driven disruptions in business applications, in digital risk, that includes uh, things like cybersecurity, insurance, and so on and so forth, um, and also industrial verticals, um, the whole industry 4.0 and IoT-driven transformation. Um, we specialize in building products uh, that have deep uh, applications of technology, like AI, computer vision, blockchain, 5G, etc. Um, we have a, a, a portfolio of about 27 odd companies. Um, maybe if we can flash the portfolio slide. Um, and, and, and the portfolio is almost evenly distributed uh, amongst these uh, areas of focus. Um, in particular, we have a, a portfolio company called Glide Health, uh, which is uh, particularly focused on uh, provider revenue intelligence uh, and therefore more centered around healthcare. Um, but a variety of companies uh, in business application uh, optimization, in industrial, uh, uh, IoT, um, digital risk, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so with that uh, introduction uh, to Hive, uh, we, we look forward to kicking start this event. Uh, so it's a pleasure and an honor to introduce the panelists to all of you. Um, uh, we have uh, Dr. Michael Kolajay with us, um, who is one of the foremost uh, thought leaders uh, and thinkers uh, driving the reform and, and transformation of the U.S. healthcare industry. Um, he is the Chief Innovation Officer of Agri Health, uh, which works closely with providers, payers, uh, various different actors in the healthcare industry to transform themselves, um, and, and especially even uh, so, more, so much more relevant in the current COVID situation. Um, he has had a very illustrious uh, uh, career uh, as uh, in all forms of uh, business and medical uh, leadership roles uh, across uh, Flatiron, Aetna, um, US Oncology, and so on and so forth. In fact, I was just commenting before we started the event that uh, you know, I don't have enough time to you know, give uh, Dr. 
Kolaji, a full introduction. There's so much to uh, talk about Dr. Kolaji, and I'm sure in the course of this conversation, uh, you, you'll come to see various facets of, of his thinking, vision, and, and kind of advocacy um, in making our country's uh, healthcare system uh, really work for all of us. Um, um, uh, incidentally, we had reached out to uh, Dr. Kolaji uh, for a physical event uh, that was supposed to be organized around this time. Uh, and we are very glad that uh, uh, he could make it uh, uh, to this virtual event, uh, even in the, in the current uh, uh, kind of conditions. Uh, uh, thank you, Doctor, for that. Um, along with Dr. Kolaji, we have Dan Lauder, uh, who is the uh, co-founder and, and chief commercial officer of Glide Health, uh, which is one of our portfolio companies. Um, Dan uh, joined us uh, at Glide uh, from, uh, uh, with a very illustrious uh, career uh, in, in uh, building platforms, uh, applications of technology and data uh, in, in various aspects of uh, provider and payer uh, kind of landscape. Um, he was with uh, Mekerson uh, as the chief technology officer and head of their uh, platforms uh, for, uh, for over 10 years uh, uh, as a part of the specialty healthcare. Um, and, and before that, uh, uh, he has had a very I think uh, Dr. Kolaji has uh, uh, insights into the policy uh, and, and uh, care and provider behavior, and Dan's uh, insights into the promise of data technology uh, and platforms that can truly transform this vertical. Um, Dan, uh, take it away from here. Thanks, Kamesh. I appreciate that. And good afternoon, and good morning, and good evening, everybody. Uh, really looking forward to, to connecting here with Dr. Kolodze. Uh, we actually have uh, a lot of our history in common. Uh, we were both uh, with the U.S. Oncology Network, so both have uh, quite a bit of, of oncology experience. Uh, Dr. Kolodze, obviously more than me as being a physician and an oncologist, uh, but uh, I, I spent most of my career in the oncology world and, and really enjoy uh, the focus of uh, you know, cancer and, and working with patients. The way we thought we would construct it today is by kind of uh, looking at it from the lens of the different stakeholders within healthcare. So you've got the providers, uh, the patients, uh, life sciences, what we call pharma and, and biotech, and uh, the payer lens as well. So we're gonna kind of walk through how this crisis has essentially impacted these different stakeholders uh, within the healthcare continuum. Uh, and it goes without saying that it's it's been substantial, obviously. There's been a lot of impact to um, you know, whether it's provider volumes, whether it's uh, patient access to uh, healthcare, whether it's uh, the impact on payers and, and now covering, um, you know, a pandemic that, that they didn't know that they would have to cover, um, which obviously throws their actuarial analysis out of whack. Um, and then bio, bio um, life sciences and, and biotech companies and how they're kind of, you know, dealing with, with some of these issues as well. So what I thought I'd do uh, is, is kind of talk a little bit initially about kind of the, uh, the impact to the providers. And so in, in talking with Dr. Kolodze prior to the event, we talked a little bit about, you know, how are hospitals impacted and, and how are clinics impacted. And one of the stories that I shared with him was that about two weeks ago, actually almost a month ago, I went in for an emergency appendectomy. Um, and initially, this is during the COVID crisis, initially I was concerned about you know, is this going to, um, should I be going to the hospital right now? And, and what was interesting is when I got there, it was basically empty. Um, and there wasn't, um, you know, a lot of people there. Because um, we're, we're not in a, a, ver a very dense area here in the East Bay of California. And I kind of shared that story with, with uh, Dr. Kolodze. Um, and we, we talked about just the impact on hospitals. So, you know, Dr. Kolodze, what have you seen? as far as hospitals are concerned, what is the impact to hospitals and um, maybe the, the follow-up to that, to, to clinics? Um, and it, it probably depends on what specialty we're talking about, but what, what are some of the things that you've seen around the hospital space um, as far as impact from the coronavirus? Yeah, sure, Dan. Dan, thanks for inviting me. Kamesh, thanks for having me. Maddie, thanks for all your help. So I, I think that um, if we look at both the hospital setting as well as the community practice setting, and I'm going to speak mostly to community oncology because mm -hmm. that's know the best. Um, I think you can classify the impact um, in, in two or three buckets. So 
uh, everyone in America is more than a little aware of the challenges from an operational perspective in terms of keeping hospital and clinic staff safe. Um, that, that means everything from kind of screening patients through personal protective equipment, through whatever. And, and, and I think what we've seen in both the community setting and uh, hospital setting and in the community practice setting are challenges that were created with, um, let's say, an inadequate response of the supply chain. People were scrambling like maniacs to get personal protective equipment. Um, and that took up just an intense amount of time. Mm -hmm. I think <laughs> practices um, and, and hospitals to a, a lesser extent had to change the way they interface with patients uh, at the point of care. So for example, in the office, screening patients before they came in and then when they came in. Um, limiting visitors. Um, it, it really became, um, there, there became a single-minded focus on trying to control flow. In the, in the office setting, that led to consolidation of practice sites. So for example, a lot of the larger oncology practices in America have multiple sites of service. Mm -hmm. And it was just impossible to do this kind of, of PPE and screening and that in all of them. So they had to consolidate. Um, so that if they had six or seven sites of service, um, the, the practices um, went to two or three. Mm -hmm. Hospitals closed wards, right? Hospital closed general med surge wards. They didn't need them. Uh, they needed the ICU beds, or at least we thought they needed the ICU beds. Um, it really changed foot traffic. It, it, it changed the volume. In oncology, it's probably reasonable to think about patients as falling into three buckets. New patients, uh, patients on active treatment, and, and patients who are on routine follow-up or let's call it survivorship care. Um, <clears throat> new patients have, have dropped to an absolute trickle. Um, uh, depending on who you ask, somewhere between 60 and 90 percent of new patient referrals for an oncology practice have dried up because new patients are the lifeblood of an oncology practice. If you look at the follow-up group, about one-third of patients are on active treatment and about two-thirds are... What we've seen is that most of those active patients, even though they're very anxious, have continued to to follow up. And so the data that's been published suggests that 80 to 90 percent of patients on treatment have continued with the treatment. But we've also learned <clears throat> that about 60 to 90 percent of the routine follow-ups have not mm -hmm. come in. And, and so it's funny because I was talking to my primary care doctor last week and he said, you know, when we, um, when we first started in this COVID thing, uh, we, we, our foot traffic dropped 90%, literally overnight. Wow. And he said, um, we started telehealth, and we're going to talk about telehealth in a minute, yeah. and that back up to 25 to 40%, and they've just started to be really, really active in screening patients, so their volume has started to come back up. Now, there are profound economic consequences, of course, related to that change in patient volume. Interestingly, hospitals have, have unfortunately experienced much the same, but for a different reason, right? Mm -hmm. Everything they've been doing has been all about dealing with acute and even critical respiratory illness. What they haven't been doing is the things that they like to do or want to do, and that is, we'll call them elective, elective procedures. procedures yeah. <clears throat> so elective is kind of a weird word. It's not exactly the word I would choose for it. Mm -hmm. Active procedures include like um, having a colectomy for colon cancer. And the reason that's elective is because you can schedule it or cancel it, as the case may be. Yep. Or if you're bleeding to death, that's not elective. That's yeah. an emergency. Surgery. So, so was my, my appendectomy may have been elective, right? right. Even though I, I felt like my stomach was going to explode, right? <laughs> we'll give you a pass on that one, Dan. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, 
but but those are extremely lucrative procedures for hospitals. hospital. Yeah. Um, and so hospitals uh, where they get paid sort of a certain amount of money to take care of these acute respiratory illnesses, the profit margin on those is not very great. The profit right. margin on the elective stuff is, is huge. So you'll read all kinds of projections about how much money hospitals are losing. Yeah. And I, I think whether you like hospitals or hate them, and let's just leave my personal feelings aside, yeah. hospitals are really challenged right now because yeah. they, don't, they don't have they, they don't have a, a good ledger right now yeah. for patients they're managing. And that's also led to the, require, the, to the necessity, actually, of many hospitals furloughing staff. So people who read about this healthcare crisis in America, then they see in the, ho- in the paper that the hospital laid off 50% of the staff, and they say, what the heck is going on here? Mm-hmm. Well, think about it for a second. A scrub room, uh, an operating room tech or scrub nurse is not very helpful in the ICU. I mean, they are very helpful to America, but they are not what we need in the whole. Yep. So hospitals have, have struggled, and then practices have, um, they've also had to deal with the government, and, and I'm, I'm apolitical, but I think that in addition to the idea of how, how to procure um, PPE and other stuff, They've had to decide whether they should apply for all these loans and all this other stuff. Their cash flow is messed up. Yep. Um, and uh, they're not like Harvard. They don't have a huge endowment. I mean, they, they, are, they are a cash flow yep. business. They're a volume business. And, and they, are, they are struggling from an economic yep. perspective. Yeah, let me let me read a couple of facts for you. So, um, you know, the American Hospital Association is reporting that hospitals are bleeding more than fifty billion dollars a month. Um, many furloughs are happening. Two hundred hospitals have furloughed um, workers. There's a decline in, in annualized spending of healthcare by eighteen percent. Um, so it was interesting because I think I mentioned to you that I had talked to some friends who weren't in healthcare. And their, their first comment to me was, oh, hospitals must be doing great because they've got all this volume coming in, right? But it's, it's your point, um, you know, the elective surgeries are not happening and um, people are afraid to go into the hospital. You know, my experience, I was the only patient that I saw the entire time I was there. So, and there's kind of a dichotomy between what's happening in New York City versus even where you live in upstate New York and where I live in the East Bay, California where there's not a lot of COVID per se, and people are still worried about going in and being treated, right? I think you had mentioned that there's been a 50% reduction in heart attacks and strokes, and it's like, they probably haven't had that big of a reduction, but that's what's being, the the people are not going to the hospital because of their concern about COVID. So um, it's really interesting. Yeah, Dan, I don't know about you, but I'm not eating a healthy heart diet right now. So it's almost impossible to believe that, yeah, and this has actually been written a, num- a number of times that the uh, true volume of cardiac uh, and cerebrovascular emergencies has dropped by so much. It's exactly what you say. People are 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 scared to go to the hospital. Yeah, um, and and that cannot be good from a public health perspective. Yep. Yeah, I agree. So if you think about kind of the future, um, you know, do you does this does this essentially uh, create a scenario where there's further consolidation, right? Because you, you know, in, in the outpatient market, um, in oncology and other specialties, there's been kind of this move towards hospital acquisition and consolidation, et cetera. Uh, with the financial impact to outpatient and even hospitals, are we gonna see like further consolidation? Is that likely what's gonna happen in the future? Well, well I think the problem, so what you say is true. Uh, the hospitals have gen- generally been the aggregator or consolidator. consolidator the yeah. problem is don't got a lot of cash lying around. Yeah. So practices that are, uh, let's say, vulnerable um, don't necessarily represent particularly attractive acquisition targets right, right. now. The right. Right. Um, now, uh, I think the hospitals will rebound fairly quickly. Um, I think there's a, a fair amount of pent up demand. Mm-hmm. The question is how quickly the oncology practices are going to rebound. So there will definitely be a lag. 
we, we have not seen the nadir of, um, of patient flow, and we probably won't for a little while. Um, just recently, for example, um, numbers have been published about the reduction in mammography and colonoscopy over the course of the crisis. Right. And it's absolutely mind-boggling. It's 80 to 90%. Now, even if all those people rush in to get their colonoscopy because they couldn't wait, um, even if that happens, it takes a little while to go through the system. Um, even when you unkink the hose, for the water to get downstream takes a little bit of while. Yeah. So the practices are, well, let's just say that whatever, whatever money they're getting from the government to tide them over is likely to be stretched thin. Um, and yeah. we, will have, we will have some practices go back. There's yeah. no doubt about that. Yeah, and, and, um, and kind of on that concept of uh, postponing screening, right? And, and so the other concept there, uh, the, other, the other challenge is, if you're postponing screening, um, when people do come back and get screened, you could have more advanced cancers, right? So, so there's kind of a public health impact to delaying the screening because you're afraid to get COVID um, and, and you could have now a more advanced cancer than uh, you would have had if, if you had gotten screened earlier, right? So Yeah, Dan, that, that partially depends on whether or not you believe in screening or not. But let's say for the sake sure. of argument, Screening yeah. does what it's yeah. supposed to do. Yeah, yeah. I think it's absolutely true. Now, it, you know, I think a delay of one month is not going to make a difference. Right. If you start going to six months or nine months, then we might actually start seeing that, that yeah. advanced disease uh, patient who's going to have an inferior health outcome. I, I think a lot about this, and it's going to be so hard to measure over a reasonable period of time what the public health consequences of COVID outside of COVID are going to right. be. And yeah. I, 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 you know, I personally completely believe it's going to make a big difference. I'll give you an anecdote. Yeah. I do a volunteer internal medicine clinic and I, I work at a homeless shelter and um, we've been uh, doing remote visits for about a month now. Mm -hmm. We had a meeting last week about trying to open up. And, and we were talking about this, and the fact of the matter is, it's not that it's impossible to manage hypertension remotely. It's impossible to manage hypertension remotely in a homeless popula population, or in a population where you haven't got, you know, the, their digital devices or their home blood pressure monitors, right, all that. Right. Other. If you can't measure the blood pressure, you cannot manage hypertension. Yep. So, I mean, it, the the snowball effect on public health, which to this point, it has not gotten anywhere near enough attention, in my opinion, Yeah, it's going to be substantial. Yeah, and it's going to be directly correlated to how long this persists, right? Essentially. Yeah, I agree. So, yeah. So it's the balance between how much is the impact of COVID versus how much is the impact of uh, people not getting the care that they need because they're concerned about COVID, right? So yeah, it's... Uh, it's definitely kind of a challenge for sure. Um, so we talked about telemedicine a little bit or touched on it. Um, what are what some of the things that you're seeing around telemedicine? I think we've seen, you know, in Massachusetts, for example, um, penetration went from 5% to 35%, so 7x in, in a matter of a month. Um, you've seen, obviously, that the, the um, telemedicine stocks skyrocket and, and utilization has has increased quite a bit. You know, does that, obviously it continues during COVID. It's not a silver bullet because there's something you just can't do um, with telehealth. And does it persist, right? And, and I know some of the challenges are around reimbursement and that's probably why it was never adopted that, that well to begin with. But now that I've done it, for example, I did an eye exam uh, online and then I saw primary care online. I was, I'm, I'm doing this forever, right? I don't, I don't have to go to the doctor and do anything else. But, but what are your, what's some of your thoughts on telemedicine and what it looks like today and, and what it looks like in the future? Yeah, Dan, you're a young guy and you Zoom, so you're not exactly representative of everybody. Sure, that's true, that's true, yeah. So, so, um, so it's really interesting because I think prior to the, um, prior to the COVID pandemic, um, there really was not much uptake of telehealth. There were a lot of reasons for that. I think um, one reason was that the providers, the, the physicians, hadn't really investigated telehealth options. 
Another was that the reimbursement and the restrictions on payment for telehealth made it in a somewhat unattractive option. You know, yeah. this as well, there were HIPAA issues. There was a requirement for video conferencing to get paid at all. I mean, there, there, were, uh, there, there was a, 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 a general promotion of like the rural health setting. When I was at Aetna, there worked, we worked with telehealth vendors. Um, usually it was for acute care. You know, my kids got an ear infection on a Saturday morning kind of stuff. Right, yep. <clears throat> but, but the idea of using telehealth for chronic disease management, not so much. Um, of course, COVID changed it, right? Because you couldn't bring the people in. And, and I think um, physicians, and I, I, that's across the spectrum, um, were, were looking for any port in a storm. They, they really were looking for a way to interact with their patients. Now, there's been a very steep learning curve. Um, and the adoption has certainly been promoted by the government, CMS specifically, being much more understanding and flexible. So what we've done is we've eliminated the need for video. We've loosened some of the HIPAA restrictions. We've uh, priced these uh, electronic visits at, at parity with face-to-face -face visits, right. same level of service. Um, those are all wonderful, wonderful things. And I will tell you that uh, having talked to a bunch of, uh, of my private commercial care colleagues, they're all doing the same thing. The, the adoption across the commercial spectrum is pretty much the same. Yeah. However, uh, I think it's probably fair to say we don't completely know what we're missing. Yeah. There are some visits, without a doubt, some visits that are going to be uh, preferentially directed to telehealth. No doubt about it. Yeah. But I also believe that the HIPAA waivers are short term. They are sure. not going to be long term. And I think the requirement for video is going to return. And I also believe, unfortunately, that parity, payment parity, is not likely to stay. And it, that's just for a very simple reason. You know, when you, when you calculate the RVUs, how much you're going to pay a doctor, part of it is the practice expense component. And the practice expense component is very, very different for, um, for a televisit than it is for a face-to-face -face visit. So it's got to come down. It yeah. will come down. Yeah. Now, um, the question is, how much? Yeah. How much will the consumer voice yeah. weigh into this? Now, I've heard a little bit of exaggeration about how unhappy consumers are with driving to the office, waiting in the waiting room, et cetera, et cetera. It really, de it really, really depends. It really depends on why you're seeing the doctor, um, what you need to get out of that visit. Uh, so uh, the book is not... The, the final chapter is not written in this book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we will have more telehealth, no doubt, uh, after the completion of this pandemic. We will yeah. have more telehealth. Yeah. We will have as much as we have now. That, I think, is very, very unlikely. Yeah, the payment parity is, is the key there, right? Because ultimately, if a payer gets half as much for a telemedicine visit, sorry, a, a provider, um, they're going to say, oh, you should come in, right? <laughs> you should come in. Um, but I think the question would be, do they get to a point where they say, you know what, maybe I don't need as much overhead and maybe there's a percentage of my patient population that I can run through telehealth and maybe I'm getting reduced revenue, but I'm offsetting that by reducing my overhead uh, commensurate to that revenue. But that, that's a long-term thing, right? So then it, then it comes down to the patient demand, right? What is the patient gonna demand? And ultimately, they're going to defer to the physician because a physician will know more about what can and cannot be done in person. So, it, it, you know, there's definitely been a ramp up. I, I could see it ramping down unless the payment parity stays the same. Um, so it'll, it'll definitely be interesting to see what happens. Um, my grandfather is in his 80s. He saw his cardiologist through telehealth and, and he, he loved the experience. So I, I think, you know, we'll see. Yeah, I know uh, younger people are obviously a little bit, um, you know, more comfortable, but I think older folks too are getting more comfortable. And then you've got uh, devices that you can now plug into your phone for like, you know, um, blood pressure, pulse ox, things like that. So it could be more and more that you can do in, in kind of a telehealth situation. But yeah, it'll be hard to, 
to determine the the longevity of it until we get past this kind of you know COVID fog essentially. So, yeah, I think it's true. It's it's interesting. Um, one of the extensions in oncology of the telehealth question has been the idea that you could actually give chemotherapy in the patient's home. That's a, yeah. that's a that's a whole nother ball of wax. Right. For oncology practices, that's threatening. Why is it threatening? Because they make a lot of money on it, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the that's the primary driver of a of a practice's success or profitability or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And it it's it is somewhat complicated, right? I mean, practices have very complex in-house uh, pharmacy units to prepare the chemotherapy. They have oncology trained nurses. It is it is a sophisticated dance, right? Yeah. And some of the drugs have significant acute toxicities that require management by a healthcare professional on site. Now, um, for as long as I can remember, the commercial payers have been interested in moving some of the chemotherapy to the home. Yeah. Not because of quality, nor is it because of convenience, it's because of cost. And the hypothesis is, if that, that the payer will be able to negotiate with the manufacturer for a discount, they will, they will have the drug at a lower acquisition cost, they will not have to pay the cost plus that they pay the oncologist. Um, in, in other words, they'll save money. Mm -hmm. and, but thus far, and, and, and during COVID, there was a, 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 actually um, an instruction that facilitated um, Medicare to pay for it this way, which yeah. they'd never paid for before. But the problem is that, you know, <laughs> they set up so many rules around it that it just wasn't worth it. It just yeah. wasn't worth it, yeah. right? So I think, um, you know, I've talked to some of my friends about whether they want to explore this, right? Um, the payers do, the, the providers, they get chest pain when they think about it. Yeah. There's no way they want any part of this. So we'll we'll see how it plays out. Yeah, but. it's kind of it's kind of akin to that brown bag concept that they had. Uh, some payers would ship the drug directly, right? And then uh, it's up to the practice to keep the inventory separate, and there's a lot of logistical issues with that. Um, so it'd be interesting to see if if anything like that uh, kind of persists into the future. Yeah, but I mean, I, I think I think the theme here is you know. Nothing will happen unless um, it supports the financial, unless there's a financial support for it, right? Like telemedicine may be more convenient for a patient, but ultimately if the provider is going to make more money on the in office visit, then that's likely what's going to persist, right? Like it took something like COVID for telemedicine to really take off because we created this parity situation between a telehealth visit and an, and an in office visit. So it just, it seems like um, there's got to be a financially compelling reason uh, for uh, things to change in the healthcare system. Is that, is that a fair comment or is that too, um, you know? I think even with parity, even with parity, there's, there's going to be some determination of what constitutes optimal care. Yeah. And that's fine. That's the way it ought to be. It, it's funny. I was talking uh, last week to a to one of the uh, big cancer advocacy groups that I've worked with in the past. And they're about to launch a large uh, nationwide survey of patients, cancer patients, and how they feel telehealth is treating them. And I think that would be really, really interesting. Yeah. Look at what they like and what they don't like. And I'm not going to pretend that I know what the results of that survey are going to show. But I, I think yeah. it's a good idea. I told them I love the idea. Yeah, I think that's great. It'd be great to see that. Once you guys, once they do that, it'll be excellent. Um, hey, so I, I got, uh, <laughs> that's funny. So um, we did a couple of polls, uh, Dr. Cloge, and one of them was like using a baseball analogy, what, what inning are we in as far as COVID is concerned? And we had second inning, fifth inning, eighth inning, and then some people, uh, we put what's baseball? And some people actually said what's baseball. Uh, but the second inning was 75% of what, how people responded. So, I mean, I would say the same thing, but it's interesting that most everybody feels like we're kind of at the beginning of this thing, right? Like we're not, 
it's not as though there's a, a treatment, a vaccine that's coming around the corner or, or that we're going to all of a sudden, you know, um, solve this problem tomorrow. Is that, do you feel like we're in the second inning or do you feel like we're, you know, in a later inning or an earlier inning or? So I'm, I'm going to paraphrase what Rand Paul said to Tony Fauci yesterday, which pretty much made me laugh so hard I had to fall off my chair. He yeah. said, you could use a little humility. So I'm going to say that I have a lot of humility. Yeah. And whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. Yeah. yeah it, it, it's entirely possible it's the second inning that, that we, we are only starting to understand what the natural history of this disease is and that we're going to have a second wave and all that other stuff. But that's one view. I actually think we're in the fifth inning. Um, I, I think, I hope that, um, that we have, are going to start to turn the corner in terms of the potential for explosive infection. I, I think we've learned a lot about the effects of social distancing and, and hand washing, all that stuff. But we're not gonna go back on that. I mean, we're just not gonna go back on that. Yeah. Um, so I, I would like to think we're in the fifth inning. Um, I love baseball and it's killing me that I can't watch my <laughs> It is killing yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. But, but uh, and actually, I'm sure Dodgers fans are also pretty torn up about this. Yeah. But, um, but you know, I, who knows? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, at the NFL, kindly you landed right in the perfect spot, right? It was like two weeks after Super Bowl, and then maybe the season gets to gets to play. Who knows? We'll have to see. Uh, the other question that we posted out there was, how comfortable would you be going to a hospital for treatment today? Right. So. Very comfortable, somewhat comfortable, and, and no way. So it's interesting because like very few people are very comfortable. It was like probably one or two people. Somewhat comfortable is about two thirds, and then no way is about a third, right? So still a third of the people are like no way, right? And and so, I mean, for me, I, when I went, I was I, I was a little concerned, but I was more concerned about the fact that my stomach felt like it was gonna you know, jump <laughs> in my body. Um, and the fact that there wasn't a lot of people there actually made me feel better, I guess. Um, but it is interesting to kind of see how people are thinking about hospitals and, and whether there's a concern. And it obviously it depends too. Like, I don't know how comfortable I would have been walking into, you know, the, the Kenneth Langone center in, in Manhattan. Right. But, but uh, here in, in Walnut Creek, um, I wasn't, wasn't that concerned about it. So is that, does that sort yeah, of, I, I, you, you I, just, I, you just said it. I, I, I think that here in upstate New York, I'm very comfortable walking into the hospital if I need, yeah. I need to, um, if I'm in Manhattan, if I'm in Queens, especially, I'm not so sure about that one. But uh, yeah, I, I think uh, one of the great lessons here is that all the models have been messed up because they haven't accounted for the heterogeneity of the United States of yeah. America. Yeah. Um, and and uh, I am hoping, I am hoping New York City is, uh, is a special case for some very special social, socio-demographic reasons. Um, of course, there's so much we have to learn. So yeah. I would have no problem. It's funny. I had my colonoscopy right before this all hit the fan, <laughs> pun intended. Yeah. But I had to, I had to, I had to cancel my uh, annual wellness visit. Uh, and I was, I was actually going to reschedule it today, but I didn't get around to it. But I, I'm yeah. going. Well, you, well, you I'm tired fine. of waiting. You, you look I'm sorry? fine, so you're probably well. <laughs> I'll, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll diagnose you right here. Yeah, but I'll tell you, if I have hypertension, you have no idea. That's true. So that's, that's true. That's true. But maybe there's a, an AI um, algorithm that can kind of determine that based on your your pulse and something else. So, well, yeah. well, I'm fat, so I don't got that going for me, Dan. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hey, so um, I, we've got a little bit of time left. I wanted to kind of, before we get into questions, because there are a few of those, I wanted to talk about payers for a little bit, right? So, um, you know, some people may say, oh gosh, the payers are probably taking a bath because they're paying for all this COVID stuff. And then some people may say, well, actually, but they're not paying for elective procedures. Um, and then other people may say, yeah, but they're also going to be um, hit because there's a lot of layoffs. And so there's, there's fewer people paying premiums. So like, how, how should we think about the impact of payers? And it probably depends on if you have a large like Medicare Advantage population versus commercial payers, like Humana's got a huge Medicare Advantage population, so they're probably doing okay. Uh, but how, how should we think about payers and the impact on payers? 
Yeah, I think you, you, you enumerated several of the factors that I think are important. First is, of course, is that um, um, they have not been paying a lot of claims out for elective care. Right. I know, and this has been published, many of the payers, uh, their first quarter um, earnings projections, uh, their profitability has been, has been really good. I mean, really high. Um, COVID claims are expensive, but you know, commercial insurance companies got ways to protect themselves against really, uh, really high claims, right? They've got stop loss insurance and what have you. So um, right now, commercial payers are sitting, they're sitting pretty, right? They expect the pent up demand for medical services to lead to a significant increase uh, above project projections for the second half of the year. Yep. But Look back in 2008, 2009, after the um, uh, recession, uh, it actually took a while to get the machine uh, churning again. Um, and so they will continue to do, my projection is that they will continue very well throughout the course of the year. Yep. They, they will be fine. Um, now, uh, what's going to happen going forward, I don't have any clue. I do think I do think that the, the questions regarding people losing their health insurance because they got furloughed or fired or their a place of employment went belly up is, is something that's very hard to project at this point. Yeah. Um, you may have read that several of the states that uh, did not expand Medicaid are now reconsidering that stance. Mm -hmm. The Medicaid enrollment is clearly increasing at this point. Um, it may increase by as much as 10%. Um, the reason that this is important, especially for providers, and, and I'm not doing a commercial for you, but it actually falls right in your wheelhouse. All right, let's hear it. <laughs> is the issue that when a patient comes in to be treated, they may well think they've got health insurance. Mm -hmm. When in fact, they don't. So if you come into your oncologist's office and you think you got health insurance and he gives you that first dose of your PDL one drug for your lung cancer uh, and you sign that waiver and you don't have health insurance, that practice just took a huge hit in their bad debt. I mean, so I think verification of benefits, especially as we come out of this and we start to see consumption of healthcare resources yeah. is going to so important. It's yep. going to be so critical because if that bad, that bad debt goes up too much, it's going to kill the practices. It, hospitals, they can get emergency Medicaid and stuff like that. That's not the best, but it's something. But, but I think practices are uh, verification of benefits. It's going to laser focus on that. Yeah. It's going to be so important. And um, now the loss of the premium dollar because let's face it, most of the employed, the commercially employed population is pretty healthy, right? The, the, um, the, there's not much cancer, for example. There's very little. Yeah. Less than 1%. Um, the, that premium dollar offsets um, that they're spent for people who are not so well. Mm -hmm. And so, you have something what the health plans called adverse selection, which is the people who are insured are disproportionately ill, consume more resources, and therefore cost you more money. Right. So the loss of those premium dollars, it, a, a lot of the health plans are really starting to project what that means for their bottom line, looking at their cash reserves in case it turns out to be worse than they thought it was. Yeah. People say, oh, you know, those, those employees are just going to pay for COBRA. All I'll suggest to you is if they if they're lining up for food bank, they're, they're not, not they're not paying for Cobra. Yeah, <laughs> and Cobra Cobra is yeah. irrelevant. Yeah, right. So yeah, so we'll see what happens. It's gonna be it's gonna be a scary time the rest of the year. Even even if we really have done a great job with COVID, it's gonna be a scary time. Yeah, well, it's I mean it's a zero sum game, right? So the fifty billion a month that the hospitals are losing, the the pay gain that right i mean it's not yeah. payers and patients and i mean you know it's not as though that money isn't benefit you know there's a benefit somewhere else in the healthcare you know, stakeholder group essentially so uh, yeah but but we can look at that as a uh, 
low interest loan. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It could it could be pent up, and yeah. but there's only so much capacity too. That's right. So it's not as though you're going to see twice as many patients all of a sudden. So it, I, I think there would be a long tail, um, and it'll be a you know it's a no interest loan essentially. So okay. yeah. you know, so it, it is interesting. So I'm gonna I'm gonna jump to a couple of questions because you know there's about five or six here. Um, there's actually one from. Uh, Jill Maddox, who used to be a, or is still working at McKesson, sorry, <laughs> my old colleague. Thoughts on mail order increasing, and what about increased utilization of alternative infusion centers or home infusion? So we kind of touched on that a little bit. Yeah, this, uh, uh, with, with respect to the mail order stuff, I think it really depends a lot on benefit design. Uh, I think we know that patients on chronic medications um, are increasingly using mail order. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, that was in the paper today. In yeah. Fact. Um, but uh, I think spe specialty drugs are a different case. And as you may know, part of the millions of things that the government has done around COVID uh, has been to make it possible for uh, Part D, D as in dog beneficiaries, to get more than one month of their, dr their drug at a time. Yeah. That's nice and that's fine. But that doesn't mean they get more than one month for one month coinsurance. <laughs> mm -hmm. You gotta pay three times as much. <laughs> so that's a lot of money for some people, even, even if they're in the catastrophic phase, right? So um, at least until we fix part D. That's, we could do another webinar on part D. That's yeah. all. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but so I think the mail order thing, yes, for general prescriptions, specialty, eh, you know. Yeah. Now, so the, the question about alternative uh, sites of care. So that's kind of like the home infusion. I, I have to tell you, um, and again, this is my opinion. I work for Aetna, but I, other than the fact that I have some CVS stock, um, I, I don't know. Full, full disclosure. <laughs> I swear when uh, CVS bought Aetna, I was completely convinced that they were going to use their bricks and mortar sets to develop sites of service for things like al alternate site for infusion. Yeah. Optum has come out and said they they have every intention of doing that. Yeah. The, and, and I expect both of those to happen, but I'm not sure it's as much related to COVID as it is to what we talked about a while ago about home infusion, which is they think they can manage costs oh, right. better. Yeah and that they can introduce a little market force on the cost of drugs. Maybe they can, maybe they can't. I, I have doubts. But, um, but yes, I think we're going to see growth in that. It's going to take a little, bit of, a little bit of time for that to occur. I don't know of any hospital-based practice that has infusion services or community-based practices that has infusion services that want to give them up. Yeah. No. No. Not no. No. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's kind of the lifeblood, right? I mean, the billing for the drugs and the services and even it's, even though it's only ASP plus six, but there's still that, um, that margin, especially on a PD, PD one or something like that. Yeah, but it's plus, yeah, it's but it's, it's plus six for, um, for Medicare, but for commercial, for commercial have, yeah. plus 15 to plus 20 for the com community practices. And then of course, You'll never find out how much the hospitals get paid because they're they black yeah, they kind of, yeah. transparency. Where's the price transparency? Yeah, that's yeah. what we're that's what we're waiting yeah. for. Uh, there is there is one question on uh, out of pocket systems and telemedicine, uh, and I think that probably means like you know um, almost like private or just and and I'm assuming some of these telemedicine solutions take. Uh, you don't need insurance to use them, right? I'm pretty sure you don't have to use insurance. Um, I, I, Teladoc. I, I, or, think if, I think if they're commercial, yeah, they're, if they're a com like Teladoc, I think you have. I think you have to have health insurance. Okay. But I think for the physician to do a telehealth visit with you, they would bill directly the 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 health plan, so they can do a telehealth visit with you irrespective. Like you know, I, I for example, I have no idea what Medicaid's policy is right now about telehealth. They probably pay you you know, 75 cents for a telehealth visit or something like that. Yeah. But, uh, but it's, you know, I think um, it's funny. My wife's an oncologist and she showed me the piece of paper 
that, that her practice gave her about what code she's supposed to build for the various payers. It, it's like a menu from a Chinese restaurant. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. 9,000 yeah. things on it. Yeah, yeah. well, it's and crazy. that's it, that actually leads to, you know, so prior authorization, um, yeah. some of the other things that are happening, you know, a lot of practices are using matrices or grids or, you know, there's, there's not really a, a, a digital solution that is saying, hey, based on this particular uh, patient, J codes, uh, treatment regimens, whatever, or in different specialties, you need to get a prior auth, right? So, so a lot of this is done manually, yeah. for example. And I would imagine that as we get further and further into the COVID uh, experience, there might be more and more that get added to that prior auth list. So, um, you know, it seems like, you know, intelligent solutions that provide a recommendation on what should be a prior auth seems like a good, you know, good opportunity there. Yeah, Dan, we can talk about, about prior auth too. I mean, um, yeah. so, so what the interesting thing is that some of the, some of the commercial payers, especially the big nationals, have started to develop portals, usually administered by a third party, Evacor, for example, or in the case of United Optum. Yep. Um, and, and they require submission of all treatment plans, all treatment plans. And it, it auto adjudicates the treatment plan and, and auto prior offs to the extent that it fits with the content that's within that portal. Right. Now, the problem really is, and, and you know, that's not a bad idea. The problem is everybody's got their own portal, right? Yep. Still very, very manual. Yep. So, you know, anymore, if you've got a Cigna or a United patient, you got to put your treatment plan in that portal. Yep. And to worry so much about the prior off because that's going to be done automatically. Yeah. Um, but if you're not working with one of them, with your Blue Cross Blue Shield plan, for example, that generally are not quite as sophisticated as the national health plans, um, yeah, it, uh, those are treacherous waters, baby. Yeah, you could, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah you, patients kind of get mad when they go to the pharmacy and the, and the, and the pharmacy says, yeah, well, it'll be $15,000, so yeah, yeah. not good. Yeah, maybe, so we've got three minutes left. Maybe one last question for you before we kind of close out the session. Uh, when, you, when you look at, you know, just any part of the healthcare uh, continuum areas for improvement, wh where do you see kind of um, probably the biggest opportunity for technology, right? And, and, and something, you know, we can call it AI or machine learning or just automation. Um, where are the areas that you think are, the most broken, let's say, or if we had a better solution would provide the most value for either a provider, a payer, a life sciences company for that matter, or the patient, obviously. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure I have one. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Send so, me the list. Uh, yeah, I, I start working on it, yeah. <laughs> I, no, I, I, I really do like the concept of um, electronic engagement with the patient. Yeah. The symptom monitoring, toxicity monitoring, it's that I, I think that's that's right for for improvement. Uh, we've done nothing in that space. I also believe, and this is not unrelated, I also believe the use of analytics, access to claims, artificial intelligence to optimize treatment of our extraordinarily heterogeneous patient population. It's, it's got to happen. You know, when I was at Flatiron, I used to tease them every day, every day, that that's what we were going to build. Yeah. They went a slightly different path. But I still think, and, and I know I'm not alone, that that, that area of, of collecting information about the patient so that when that patient's sitting in front of you and they say, Doc, what happens to me yeah. if I get treatment? You can actually give them a semi-intelligent answer. Yeah. Not just a, a gut response. So yeah. that those two areas, I think are, are I think in the next five years, those two are just gonna take off. Yeah. So based on my uh, my the sequencing of my genome and uh, very specific information about my clinical profile, you know, how is this drug gonna interact with me? What is my what is the toxicity gonna look like? What are, what's the emetogenic and and um, uh, the neutropenic risk, et cetera. So, and then we uh, add, in, then we add in information we learned about, you know, 30 somethings who got this treatment 
and were they able to go to the gym? I mean, there's just so much we're going to learn about how the way we treat our patients affects them and how we can ideally intervene to make that better. That's that's the great. Yeah, just one last thought on that. It's almost like instead of, you know, leveraging NCCN guidelines, it's almost creating guidelines based on what's happened to other patients in the past, right? So so learning from retrospective information. So that's great. So as my uh, friend, as my yeah. friend Amy Abernathy would say, we got to learn from every single patient we treat. Yes, absolutely. Good deal. Well, I think we're just at time. I see Maddie's, uh, Maddie's uh, hopped in there. So <laughs> did you want to close us? I just want to thank you again, Dr. Cologe. Great conversation. And, and I'm sure folks got a ton of value out of it. And uh, looking forward to uh, connecting with you again at some point. And Maddie, I'll kick it over to you. I just want to say thank you, Dan and Dr. Cologe, for a very informative session on healthcare in the era of COVID-19, and to thank all of our uh, participants for joining us today from all over the world. We really appreciate it. We hope to see you at our webinar next week, and everyone have a great day and stay safe. Thanks. Thanks, all. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Cologe. Thanks, Dan. Stay well, guys. Bye-bye.